Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Ambrogio Cesabianchi. I am chairing this session uh, on international trade and macroeconomics. Uh, this is organized by uh, the CIBRA uh, International Trade and Macro Group and uh, is jointly organized with Silvana Tenreiro, who uh, might be joining us uh, shortly. So let me remind you very quickly the rules of the game. You have 25 minutes for your presentations. I'm going to be very uh, strict with time and uh, I'm gonna, um, when there is one minute left, I'm gonna just uh, unmute myself and let you know so you can uh, time your presentations. Uh, the presentations are gonna be followed by a 10 minute discussions, uh, discussion by, uh, by discussants and there's gonna be a five minutes uh, slot at the end for general discussion. For all attendees, if you have clarification questions, please uh, write them in the Q&A box. And if you have general questions, please also write them in the Q&A box. Uh, I am gonna uh, read them out loud uh, during the Q&A um, session. Uh, I think that's all for me. And given the time constraints and the relatively small short time we have, I'm gonna pass uh, on to Matteo Cacciatore from HEC Montreal, who's going to present the first paper in the session, Self-Harming Trade Policy, Protectionism and Production Networks. The uh, floor is yours. Th thank you, Ambrogio, and uh, thank you all for, for attending. This is joint work with um, Alessandro Bartieri, who's also in Montreal. And uh, what the paper does essentially is to estimate uh, uh, the dynamic effects of, uh, of protectionism uh, um, by looking at their effect through pro production linkages. And essentially, the, the paper is truly done in three parts. And uh, the first part is, is about uh, identifying uh, uh, trade policy shocks in the data. And uh, we use uh, monthly disaggregated data on uh, US temporary trade barriers. Uh, in particular, we construct uh, uh, at the level of NICE for digital industries. Uh, the import shares uh, of products that are subject to new uh, uh, investigation um, over time. Now, for those of you who are not familiar with what temporary trade barriers are, uh, I'm, I'm going to spend uh, uh, a little time on, on this presentation, but uh, just as an overview, TTB is essentially a collection of, of three main items, uh, um, anti-dumping uh, um, duties, countervailing duties, and, and global safeguards. That's the first part of the paper. Uh, once we have this, uh, this trade policy shocks, uh, we essentially construct a measure of what we call upstream protectionism. Uh, in a nutshell, we take the shocks and uh, we combine them with disaggregated uh, input output tables and very much in the spirit of uh, a former literature that looked at the effects on, of uh, uh, tariffs on intermediate goods, we construct uh, essentially a measure that a given industry, a measure of protection is that, that a given industry face uh, through the usage of, uh, of uh, uh, intermediate inputs. And in the third part of the paper, uh, we essentially use this uh, trade policy shocks uh, within an industry and at the upstream level to estimate uh, panel local projections. And uh, in particular, to estimate uh, the response of employment and prices uh, to uh, an increase in protectionism within an industry and through an increase in protectionism upstream. That's, uh, that's what we call the effect through production networks. Uh, it seems that uh, I am missing one slide, which is not good at all. Uh, sorry, just bear with me for a second. Uh, I'm afraid that uh, This is very strange. Okay, I'm missing a slide, but uh, uh, there are three uh, key findings as uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna document uh, in uh, in the presentation. The first finding is that we do find very shortly a small uh, um, positive effects uh, of protectionism within industry that impose uh, uh, protection. By contrast, we do find. Uh, significant, uh, fairly sizable and long lasting significant negative effects uh, on employment in downstream industry. That is uh, in industries that are facing protectionism in sectors uh, from which they use intermediate inputs. 
And finally, uh, we document that uh, uh, indeed this uh, uh, negative employment effects uh, uh, at the downstream level are stemming from an increase in prices, uh, uh, intermediate input prices and final goods prices that are associated to upstream protections. So the, the, that's the take home of, of the paper, which uh, for reasons that I'm not understanding uh, uh, is missing from the slide. And I hope that's the only slide is missing. Uh, so let me start by, by telling you a little bit why indeed uh, uh, we use temporary trade barriers. Why does it make sense to look at this type of, uh, um, at this type of uh, trade policy measure? The first thing is that uh, TTDs are the predominant uh, uh, trade policy instruments used by WTO members. And uh, arguably in the last 20 years, it's been the most important type of, uh, and the most important source of, of trade protection. Even more importantly, uh, these temporary trade barriers are used uh, uh, in a handful of uh, key upstream industries, in particular base metals, uh, chemicals, uh, plastic, rubber products. Uh, and therefore, uh, they truly provide us with, uh, with an empirically relevant uh, measure of, uh, of uh, upstream protectionism, which is ultimately what we're after in, in, in the paper. In addition, um, these temporary trade barriers typically lead uh, uh, to uh, very large tariffs, which are 10 to 20 times higher than, uh, than MFN tariffs, and they're very long lasting. Uh, for instance, they stay in place uh, uh, between five and, and, seven, and seven years uh, on average. Finally, a couple, uh, um, couple more reasons to make TTDs particularly interesting for what we're doing. Uh, the first one is that uh, they come uh, at a very disaggregated level, and uh, the, the disaggregated nature of, of the measure implies that we can actually measure input-output linkages uh, more accurately. Finally, uh, these data come uh, uh, are essentially recorded uh, uh, on, on a daily basis, so it's possible to construct uh, uh, high frequency measures of, of, of temporary trade barriers. And uh, in our context, we are, we're gonna exploit this, this high frequency variation to uh, essentially impose short term restrictions to identify uh, the dynamic effects of, of protection. Okay, now I understand what happened. The two slides got, uh, got flipped. This one you already heard of it. So let me jump, uh, let me jump into, into the data. Um, and uh, let me tell you, uh, let me give you a little bit of background about, uh, about TTD so that uh, the, the way we identify this problem can fairly straightforward to understand. So think about uh, producers in industry having the ability of petitioning the government uh, for relief from foreign dumping uh, or from uh, foreign uh, subsidies on, on a particular product. Now, um, these producers have to, to, to file a petition and uh, this petition is actually reviewed by a trade commission in the US as the US ITC, which basically assesses the compliance of the petition. And at that point, it decides whether or not to open an investigation. Then the investigation is conducted and ultimately there is either a tariff or nothing. And as I'll show you, uh, indeed, the uh, tariffs are imposed in, uh, in the vast majority of, uh, of these investigations. Now, from our perspective, there are a couple of features that are particularly important. The first one is that uh, uh, this process of uh, opening an investigation is actually a time consuming process. Uh, um, on one hand, the producers need to gather evidence about the, the, the existence of dumping or subsidized imports. Uh, and at the same time, there is uh, this assessment of compliance that has to be done prior to opening the, the investigation. And this implies that uh, at a monthly frequency, which is the frequency we, we using the analysis, it's uh, impossible essentially to, um, for investigations to respond to, 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 current, uh, to current shocks. And we're gonna exploit this. The second aspect is the fact that uh, once an investigation is opened, uh, it gets publicly announced and uh, agents can indeed access uh, the, the supporting evidence. And an implication of this is that from an econometric standpoint is that in principle, at least, uh, um, tariffs that are associated to temporary trade barriers can be uh, are forecastable. And uh, that's the main reason why, uh, as a benchmark measure, we use indeed the uh, uh, investigations rather than, than final tariffs as, uh, as our measures of, of protectionism, although uh, results don't change much if we actually use tariff data. 
Uh, the last bullet is the fact that, as I was mentioning before, the tariffs uh, are large and long-lasting, uh, and uh, and I'll show you uh, in uh, in the next slide. Uh, I'll give you here a sense of the magnitude. So this table here is reproducing uh, uh, the top PCB users uh, uh, at the level of NICE for digit uh, US industries. The first, uh, uh, well, the first column is the name of the industry. As you can see, uh, the second column uh, records uh, uh, TTB episodes, uh, where an episode is uh, uh, a month in which there is at least one uh, investigation open. As you can see, this, these episodes are fairly concentrated in key, in key industries. Uh, uh, and in particular, iron, steel, uh, and ferro alloy is the, the most important users. Uh, the second column shows that uh, uh, the probability of having a tariff imposed is very high uh, across, uh, across the industries. The third column shows that uh, the median tariff that is imposed is also uh, very sizable. Uh, it can be as high as 115%, uh, for example. And the last column gives you a sense of how open uh, this, uh, these industries are uh, in the U.S. And uh, uh, on average, the, the, those, are all, the, those are all industries that, uh, that uh, are, fairly, uh, are fairly open with, with, with some heterogeneity, but, but they're all fairly open. The second and last table I'm going to show you uh, is a table that indeed summarizes the importance of this uh, top uh, industry top users of TTBs at the industry level for the production, for U.S. production. Um, so the, the, the second column here uh, reports the output share of these industries, and uh, you see that uh, the top 10 users amounts to 10% of, uh, of total output. And the second and the third one use input-output tables to actually construct the uh, average measure of uh, input shares, that is, uh, uh, how much each industry is actually contributing on average as, as an input. And uh, as you can see, uh, when you look at the total, uh, these top 10 users account for roughly 25% uh, of, of all intermediate goods um, uh, in, uh, in, in, in the U.S. Uh, in, in the US sector. Okay, so now let me tell you, so those are, this is just to give you an idea of what TTBs are, where they are used, uh, uh, now let me tell you what is the measure that we're going to use uh, in, in the econometric analysis. So essentially what we, we construct is a measure, a sectoral measure, uh, at, uh, again, max for uh, uh, digit, of uh, the share of imports that are affected uh, by temporary trade barriers in a given month. So essentially uh, you go by industry, here you have a weight omega and uh, here there is a dummy variable i. So essentially what we do for each industry in each month, uh, we sum uh, the share of bilateral sectoral imports uh, uh, from uh, a specific country that is actually subject to TTB. And we use the previous, uh, year, um, previous year import data uh, to, to avoid uh, endogeneity. Uh, issues, of course, there is uh, a trade-off uh, um, with respect to uh, the no weight bearing principle we are, we are introducing. Um, the advantage of this measure is that it combines both uh, the extensive margin, that is the, the, the variation in the number of uh, TTB investigations, but at the same time, it also accounts for its intensive margin. And this is important because you may have just a single uh, product line that is uh, uh, subject to TTBs, but with a very large value of trade against multiple uh, product lines with small amount of trade, and we, we want to capture that. So once again, this is the measure we use. It's basically the sectoral import shares uh, that is subject to new TTBs in a given month. Okay. This is to give you an idea of the variation of the data. Um, so focus on the, the, the top left uh, uh, panel here. So the red line is uh, the uh, industry employment growth uh, and uh, the, the blue histograms represent these uh, trade shares subject to TTBs in a given month. Uh, when you see zeros, it means that there were no, uh, um, no products uh, uh, subject to TTBs in that particular month. Now, a couple of things from this picture. The first one is the fact that uh, uh, the, the variation in general uh, is, 
is quite large, in particular, both within and across uh, and across industries. This, this, the shares can get as high as uh, thirty percent in some in some instances. And the second part, to the the second aspect that I wanted to notice is the fact that there seems to be uh, a little bit of cyclicality. Uh, that is, uh, you do see spikes uh, in the trade shares that happens uh, when uh, in periods of no uh, decline in employment growth, but you also do see spikes in terms of uh, decline in the sectoral uh, employment growth. And, and of course, this in terms of we need, not surprising, to be thinking about endogeneity uh, before doing anything with, with the data. And that's where, uh, and that's where we, we start. So basically, Starting from the measure that I just described, uh, what we do is essentially we borrow from a, a consolidated identification strategy in, in the macro literature and uh, particularly in the monetary and then uh, fiscal policy. If you want a reference point uh, that, that you may be aware of, that you may have heard, it's from an enrollment. So essentially, the idea is to remove uh, uh, from this TTB variation movements that are as endogenous uh, to employment and price. And here, of course, we need to be careful because we want to remove this, this endogenous movements with respect to the past, current, and, and expected uh, variation in, in employment and price. And, and this is clearly really a notion of conditional endogeneity. And, uh, and I'm going to come back in a couple of slides to try to, to, to be clear about what is it exactly that, that, that we are taking out of the original data and what's left in there. So how do we achieve this? Uh, um, and this problem of, of TTB measures, we use two approaches. One is a pure time series approach, and it's done at the industry level. And but we also use a, a, a panel approach that basically pulls across the, across the industries. I'll, I'll, I'll be clear in, in, in a second. But uh, regardless of whether the approach is time series or panel, uh, we're going to exploit uh, uh, to rule out in current uh, uh, simultaneity. We're going to exploit uh, the the fact that at monthly frequency, this uh, institutional features of temporary credit barriers, this uh, delays introduced by TTB procedures, essentially allows us to impose a, a short-term restriction, which is the fact that TTBs do not respond to current shocks. But then, of course, we still have to deal with uh, uh, with past and expected outcomes. And here is the way we do it. So this is the time series approach. Uh, so the idea is uh, we're going to regress this uh, uh, shares of imports subject to TTB on, uh, on, on, some, uh, on some meaningful control. And uh, we want to do it, and we do it, in the context of what it's called fractional response model, uh, which uh, is not super popular in economics, but has been used uh, uh, quite a bit uh, uh, in, uh, in, in social sciences. Now, the advantage of the fractional response model is basically the fact that it restricts the conditional mean of the dependent variable, uh, the trade share, to be bounded. And uh, since the trade share is indeed bounded between zero and one, the model allows us to capture that. And it also allows us to capture the fact that there are potential non-linearities around the bound in particular uh, near zero. So without really getting lost into the, into the, um, the functional form of the model, what I want you to pay attention to is what we uh, include in, in the mean mu i t here. So essentially, what we control for, if you want, are uh, remember this is tau i t is the share of imports subject to TTB in industry i. So we control from for legs of employment growth, and this is fairly obvious because we want to make sure we orthogonalize with respect to this path, uh, um, uh, this path uh, variation. We also control for employment growth in downstream industries. That is, uh, we construct with input output tables employment growth from the perspective of industries to which industry I sells its output. We control from uh, uh, previous prices, industry prices. We include a bunch of, uh, a bunch, two actually, aggregate controls. One is the real exchange rate growth, and uh, the second one is a measure of expected industrial production from the survey of professional forecasters. And here, this variable here is MBIT minus K, is uh, the market to book ratio uh, for industry I. And the reason why we have this variable is that we borrow from, from the finance literature to construct essentially a measure of expected industry level 
uh, outcomes. And uh, I don't have time to give you the details about how we, we construct this measure, but we actually show that uh, this measure has forecasting power for employment growth, for instance, for future employment growth. So it's, it's a measure that uh, at least captures some of, of the expectations uh, of our future industry dynamics, uh, and, and therefore it's there to kind of control for the possibility that in this, these trade policy actions are, are reflecting uh, uh, forward-looking uh, um, dynamics, uh, although literally speaking, temporary trade barriers are pure backward-looking uh, trade policy instruments. They are supposed to be in place uh, uh, to deal with, uh, with pre-existing trade injury. Now, so, so this is done at the, at, the at the industry level. So we do this uh, for each industry. Now, the alternative is instead to use a panel, uh, the panel dimension of the data. And uh, the advantage essentially here is the fact that uh, uh, we can uh, we can exploit exploiting the panel dimension. We can include fixed effects, and uh, this arguably is a more conservative strategy because by including uh, industry fixed effect and time fixed effect, we, we remove uh, all the unobserved industry heterogeneity and we remove all common uh, common shocks. Now, of course, this implies that potentially we remove some variation in tau IT that is not strictly related to uh, employment and price outcomes. So this is a more conservative approach. So what we do here is, uh, is a regression in which uh, uh, we had again that the trade share of performance uh, uh, are subject to, uh, to TTBs. And then we have the same industry level controls that I described before. Then we drop, of course, aggregate controls and we have this fixed effect in there. Matteo, uh, yes. just to say that you have slightly less than five minutes and also oh, there is a client oh, okay, question. Okay. Okay. Yes, well, yes, I'm almost done. So what we identify sorry, is, the, is sorry, uh, in, sorry, what's that? And there is also a very quick clarifying question on whether there is any difference between a fractional response model and a conditional logit model. That's a tough question. Uh, <laughs> I, 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 I'll, I'll think about it and get back at the end. Let me try to, let me try to finish. Okay, you have... Um, um, so what, what essentially is left in this shock is uh, non-economic determinants uh, of, of TTB. Essentially, it's just variation uh, that is exogenous to employment and price dynamics. And there is a long uh, literature in, uh, in, uh, that addresses this uh, non-economic determinants of TTBs. And here there is, there is a list of, of potential factors. And so this variation is for sure endogenous, but is exogenous with respect to, to this, um, to this uh, economic outcomes. So we, in the paper, we document the properties of these identified shocks, and we actually show here as a picture, we actually show that for some episodes, I don't know how much you can see, indeed the predicted value of, uh, of, of the, the trade share is uh, almost uh, uh, explaining the whole variation of the trade share. Uh, there are instead other episodes in which we explain much less. Overall, for movements in the trade shares that are greater than one standard deviation, on average, we explain about 50%. Of that movement. So, with this shock in hand, we can, from now on, it's very straightforward. We essentially construct a measure of, measures of upstream protectionism using the input output tables. And so, here we basically, for each industry, we take this, uh, this intermediate input weight uh, and we construct for each sector a measure of its upstream protectionism. So, the, pro the amount of protectionism that is happening uh, in uh, the sectors that are providing inputs to, to the industry. And this is identical, essentially, to the literature that looked at uh, uh, intermediate in the effect of intermediate input tariffs. The final step is to estimate local projections. And so here we estimate two local projections. The first one regresses employment growth on uh, uh, the, the industry uh, trade policy shock. So this is employment growth in industry I and its own uh, uh, trade policy shock. And the second one is, is, is instead the regression that captures the, uh, the, uh, the effects of upstream protectionism. So we regress employment growth uh, on uh, these measures, these, this measure of upstream protectionism that, that I just described. And uh, uh, this is basically a bunch of, uh, a bunch of OLS uh, that we're doing for different, uh, different uh, time uh, horizons. And those are the results. So the top panel is the effects of uh, an increase in protectionism on employment uh, 
on the industry employment. So it's the effect within the industry. And as you can see, this is done with the time series identification. The effect is basically non-significant. Instead, there are significant uh, and uh, um, long-lasting negative effects uh, in downstream industry. So upstream protection is, triggers this long, negative and long-lasting effects on employment downstream. With the panel identification, we basically get uh, uh, a very similar picture. Uh, the effect, uh, the point estimate is slightly positive, but not significant, and it's negative and significant downstream. Now, um, why there are no beneficial employment effects in productive industries? There are several possible explanations, uh, including the fact that PPPs affect profits uh, uh, rather than output. Uh, there could be heterogeneity among uh, uh, producers within an industry in response to uh, industry TTBs. There could be offsetting forces such as expenditure switching and uh, expenditure changing, if you're familiar with this uh, kind of old fashioned macro jargon. Um, there could be different stories. But the story we're interested in is understanding why there are these negative and significant effects downstream. And so, in order to kind of get a sense of, of uh, what's behind this effect, what we do is we get uh, data on producer prices. Uh, for nights for these industries from the LS, and we construct uh, a measure of uh, uh, intermediate input uh, uh, price index for each industry, once again uh, using uh, input output tables. And then we estimate two more local projections. One is the response of this intermediate input price to an upstream protectionist shock. The idea is if upstream they're imposing tariffs, uh, my, the price of my intermediate input is going to go up, and so I should expect uh, this, this intermediate input price index to go up. And this is actually the final price of the industry, which again, if you expect uh, uh, you know, intermediate input price to go up, this also eventually results in, in higher final goods prices. And indeed, that's what we find. And uh, so the last, uh, the last uh, sign here is uh, the output price. This is the input price. And, uh, and the time profile is such that this increase in prices kind of predates the, 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 the drop, uh, uh, the drop in, uh, in, in, in employment, suggesting that it, indeed it's a story of, of loss of competitiveness that is behind, uh, that is behind uh, uh, the negative effect uh, that we find downstream. Matteo, you're now, you're now over time. You should and try the conclusion, to... uh, sorry, sorry, what's that? You should try to wrap up your overtime. I finished. The conclusion is that we do find evidence that there is uh, there are negative effects of protectionists through uh, vertical production linkages. We don't find much evidence of beneficial good industry effects. That's it. Thank you very much, Matteo. The discussant is going to be Federico Junios uh, from Yale University. Um, That's great. Okay, thanks. Uh, thanks, Ambrogio and, 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 and Silvana for, for inviting me to discuss this paper and thanks everyone who is attending the session. So I'm going to discuss this paper of self-harming trade policy, protectionism and production networks. Uh, and I'm, a, I'm, an e uh, I'm an econ postdoc at Yale and a researcher at the Central Bank of Chile. So the usual disclaimer applies. Okay, so this is, this is a very nice paper. I mean, it, it's, a, it's an important topic. It's a good design, good data. Um, so I'm gonna focus my attention on two things. One is the sort of intuition and mechanisms in terms of what we can learn economically about the results uh, of the paper. And second, some details about the implementation, some heterogeneity, some robustness uh, that would be interesting to, to, to pursue. Okay, so let me start with the first issue. So the, the goal here is to try to understand the mechanisms behind the propagation of import shocks. And I, I want to argue that the propagation of these types of shocks on employment depends uh, on four elasticities. Uh, I have some work uh, trying to characterize these things. Uh, uh, um, so, so there's a reference there, but let me just give you the main uh, punchlines of this. And I also want to focus the attention on the effects on the employment of the uh, uh, downstream industry. So the sort of the, the propagation uh, on, the, on the connected industries downstream uh, where the employment effects are, are stronger. So I'm gonna think of this shock as an input, as, a, as an intermediate input cost shock, okay? So there are four elasticities that are important. One is the elasticity of substitution of intermediate inputs that I'm gonna call delta. The second is the elasticity of substitution between labor and intermediate inputs, that I'm gonna call epsilon. The third is the elasticity of substitution of demand, that I'm gonna call sigma. And the fourth is the labor supply elasticity, that I'm gonna call gamma. 
And I'm going to argue that these four elasticities are important and the authors uh, make some uh, uh, connection with some of these, but others I think are missing and could complement the analysis that they have already done. So for example, we, we, we show in this companion paper that if you see, if you have an input cost shock similar to, to what the authors have, then you would see a decline in employment if the elasticity of substitution in demand sigma is greater than the elasticity of substitution in epsilon. And, and so, I mean, the model that I have in this paper is, is kind of very uh, typical. So there's nothing really special. So I think these, these, some of these implications are really very general. Um, and, and, what, and what's an important trade-off here is that usually the sigma, the elasticity of substitution in demand is gonna capture like scale gains uh, or scale, scale losses, right? So if you have to scale down because you have higher costs, then the degree of how much that's gonna hurt you, it's gonna depend on the elasticity of substitution in demand. But then uh, the, it, there's elasticity substitution between uh, um, um, labor and materials and that could go in, you know, it could, reinforce the scale effect uh, or go in the opposite direction depending on how big the elasticity of substitution is. is. And so the intuition there is that if, there, if workers and, and, and intermediate inputs are complements, then if you see an increase in the input cost, then you would decline both the expenditures on intermediate inputs and also decline employment. Whereas if there are substitutes, employment should go up. Right, so that's gonna be a very important elasticity. So let me go to some of the uh, exercises that the authors do. So they have this exercise in which they look at this input shock that increases both input and output prices. So this is what they showed at the end of the presentation. So here, one thing that the authors could do is that they could test the mechanism directly in the data, right? So they could think of, you know, employment uh, being a, a, a function maybe of the cost that the firm has, such as the uh, intermediate inputs, and they could, use their shock, the measure that they, they extract from the data, as a sort of shifter of these intermediate inputs and see how much that affects final employment of these firms. So they could do that because there's an issue, I mean, if you look at the sort of uh, uh, eyeballing the graphs, it's not clear that the timing of the changes in prices is consistent with the, with the, with the timing of the changes of employment of this, of this shock. It seems to be that some of the employment effects on downstream industries actually start declining before the input price kind of kicks in. Um, but obviously eyeballing is, is not a good way of doing this. So I think the, uh, the authors could look at this directly. And then the question is whether you can look at also the effects on wages, uh, um, whether you can actually measure wages in the data to actually look at that, whether this input shock changes the wages that these firms are, are, or industries are, are giving workers. But then once you're doing that, then the question is, why don't, don't go the full way and estimate the labor material elasticity of substitution? So what you would get, I mean, this is something that we have in our model, uh, in, in our paper, but I think this is a fairly, fairly general statement that if you regress the log of expenditures in materials minus the log of expenditures in labor, so the wage bill, on sort of a measure of price of material of, 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 of labor over a measure of prices of intermediate inputs, uh, then you would have this residual that would be something like the, the labor augmenting productivity, and then you would need a shifter for this relative prices. So all is equals and the, the shifter that they have would be sort of a, a good shifter for this, for this relative prices, and then they would be able to sort of back out what's the uh, epsilon, which is elasticity of substitution between laborers and uh, labor materials. My sense from what they have currently is that they would get that this is lower than one, so, so labor materials are complements, but it would be good to know how much it is and, 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 and how close it is to one. Um, so I think that would be interesting, and it seems that they have all the ingredients to look at that directly. Then they have this sort of, uh, uh, they have this in the paper, they didn't discuss this much today, this heterogeneity based on the elasticity of substitution and demand. And what they find is that the employment effects are greater or larger in industries with higher sigma. Okay, so there are a couple of things I would say here. Um, um, the first is that there's like a within industry and a between industry elasticity of substitution that is potentially important. The results that they have is a bit more consistent with the between industry is elasticity of substitution in the sense that if the cost shock 
is, is greater for an industry in which there's a lot of substitution with other industries, then you know, that industry would lose a lot because the prices of the, that industry would go up uh, and, and then demand would flow to another industry. And then employment in the original industry should go down. But then if you have sort of the within industry component, the effects might go actually in the opposite direction. If there's a lot of substitution within an industry across firms, and this shock is sort of, you know, somehow idiosyncratic to some firms and not to others, then you would see a lot of substitution in production to firms that are not affected by the shock within the same industry. And then you would see sort of at the industry level, you wouldn't see maybe such a big effect because there's, you know, consumers have a lot of a uh, capability of, of switching between different uh, uh, firms within the industry. So I think sort of being able to have proxies for this sort of between industry and within industry and sort of making the distinctions between these two would be interesting to sort of look at in the data. And then, and then the other dimension, which is this other parameter, delta, it would be interesting to explore the heterogeneity of the elasticity of substitution of intermediate inputs. And this is sort of a, a coming from this paper from Barroda and Savagnat in, 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 in the QGE, in which they look at sort of this a, 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 a natural disaster shocks and they find that you know, effects, the negative effects of a, of a natural disaster shock is stronger in industries where inputs are more specific. So I think that's also something interesting that the authors could exploit in terms of heterogeneity to see whether they hold, that holds also in their data. And, and again, this sort of parameter is very important when you think about the propagation of the shocks. And then the final parameter is the labor supply elasticity. Um, this is a very important parameter in the context of, of you know, imperfect labor markets that has been shown to be important in the US recently. So in the current context of, of, of trade shocks, that might actually also be important. And the, obviously the greatest challenge there is, is actually whether this is something feasible to implement in the data, but it will be kind of curious to see whether the effects are stronger in industries with higher labor supply elasticity. Okay, so let me mention a couple of, just to finish a couple of issues in the implementation. Federico, you have about One, minutes. Yeah, 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 so I'm gonna finish with this slide. So, so, so they could implement, the authors could implement this Rothenberg weight to understand which countries and products are driving the results, sort of in the spirit of the ship share design type of shocks uh, uh, that's out there in the literature to understand sort of which products and countries are driving this. Um, and this could be done both within the own effects and also the downstream propagation. What's also sort of important, and it's not much discussed in the paper, is the, it's the persistence of the shock, which is different to the persistence of this epsilon hat, uh, the persistence of the sort of a, a, a shock that they measure. I'm thinking more on the persistence on the, on the tariff or, 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 the, or, the, or the temporary trade barrier itself and how long that lasts and take that into account. And recently there has been some papers showing that it's important to adjust for the persistence of the shocks to kind of understand and recover both the short-term and the medium run trade elasticity. So I think this could be sort of implemented in their setup as well. And there are a couple of other heterogeneity that would be interesting to look at. One is the industry exposure to export intensity and whether that makes a difference or not. The industry exposure to import intensity, they have some of that built in the exercise, but it would be look, good to look at that explicitly to see whether that's important. And then also test the upstream propagation of the shock and think of this shock as a demand shock for some industries and see what happens to the sellers that sell to the industries that have the shock uh, 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 instead of looking at only the shock of the downstream propagation. I think that would be interesting uh, uh, to look at as well. Um, okay, but let me just finish. I mean, this, this is a relevant topic. It's a good design. They have great data and super interesting facts so far. Uh, and, and I'm looking forward to future versions of, of, of this paper. Thank you very much, Federico. Uh, I'm gonna give uh, one minute to uh, Matteo to maybe answer the most important point he thinks uh, uh, Federico raised in his discussion. And if there is any other question from the audience, please write it in the Q&A box. Uh, in the meanwhile, um, Matteo, the floor is yours. No, I just wanna thank you, Federico. It's, it's a great discussion. And uh, although my, my culture is an idiot, doesn't understand. This is Alessandro, doesn't understand. <laughs> This is calling. Um, I, I agree with, uh, with with everything actually you said. Some of this uh, the things are already in our in our agenda, in particular the, the persistence uh, uh, part uh, when it comes to uh, looking at the actual imposed tariffs. No, I agree. It's a, it's a very insightful set of comments, and uh, we do a little bit of work. We didn't discuss, as you said, about uh, 
about the role of elasticities, but uh, your comments are more more than than, uh, than appropriate, and I think that that's indeed what what we should be looking uh, uh, next. So I thank you very much for uh, for the comments. I don't have a good answer about the the the, the conditional. Um, I think Silvana answered for you uh, in, in the Q&A box, so you can have a look, maybe. Ah, okay. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> it was quite, uh, quite a useful answer. So, so uh, with that, let me thank you, Matteo, Federico, and Silvana um, for, uh, for the nice uh, discussion in this session. And we can move to the second paper uh, in this session, which is titled Invoicing and Pricing to Market, Evidence and International Pricing by UK Exporters. The paper is going to be presented by uh, Meredith, Meredith Crowley. I can see her. Okay, thanks very much. Um, hope you can hear me now. Yes. So, um, thanks very much for organizing the session and for having us here today. Um, this paper is joint with uh, Giancarlo Corsetti, who's um, on right now, as well as Lou Hahn. And so the title of the paper is Invoicing and the Dynamics of Pricing to Market. We're going to be looking at evidence from UK export prices around the time of the Brexit referendum. And just briefly a disclaimer, we use administrative confidential data from HMRC and they don't endorse um, our work in any way. So this paper is about understanding movements in international prices. So the extent to which import and export prices respond to exchange rate shocks is a very important point to understand the international transmission of shocks across markets. And it's also important to understand how these prices evolve if we want to better design stabilization policies. Previous research has shown us that when we look in the aggregate data, there seems to be a correlation between the currency of invoicing of international transactions and the degree of exchange rate pass through into import prices. And so most notably, Gita Gopinath proposed the idea of an international pricing system that stresses that the widespread use of dollar invoicing proves the dominant role of the dollar in goods trade, but also explains significant and persistent asymmetries in exchange rate pass-through across different markets. And so what we're hoping to do in this paper is to add to this discussion, and our particular question is to say, well, what can we learn about the structure of the international pricing system from the use of detailed analysis of granular transactions data from British exporters? And so our analysis here is entirely empirical, and it's going to be focused around three specific questions. And my talk today will also be structured around answering each of these three questions. The first question we ask is how do firms manage their use of invoicing currencies? Very basic facts. Do firms use one currency, more than one currency? Do they switch their currencies, the ones they choose over time? And so we're going to present four stylized facts on the invoicing choices of British firms. Three of these I think are brand new, haven't been seen before. The second question we're going to then ask is we're going to say, well, if we look at different invoicing currencies used by firms, do we observe a correlation with exchange rate pass through at the level of individual transactions data? And then more specifically, are there differences in the dynamics of exchange rate pass through when we use this, this detailed product and firm level data? In order to get at the dynamics of price adjustment, according to different currency schemes, we're going to use the large change in the value of the British sterling from June 2016, immediately after the Brexit referendum. So we'll follow price evolution right around the time of, of the Brexit vote. The third thing we're going to be looking at is we're going to start with a clear understanding. Price adjustments can involve both a change in a firm's markup as well as changes in the marginal production cost a firm faces. So one of our questions, we're going to try to tie this down and say, well, if we observe changes in prices, can we relate the choice of an invoicing currency by a firm to a specific pricing strategy? So specifically, are certain invoicing currency choices correlated with strategic adjustments of markups or pricing to market by British firms? 
In order to do this, we're going to estimate destination specific markup elasticities using the trade pattern sequential fixed effects estimator we've developed in earlier work. Now, just to set some definitions to get started, if we think about any price change, we're going to be looking at price changes for exports. A price change can be decomposed in sort of three different components. A firm can make a global adjustment to the markup it, it charges, so it can raise its markup on goods sold everywhere by 5%. It could make a destination-specific markup adjustment, so it could decide to raise its markup on sales to Canada by 20%, leave its markup on Mexican firms exactly where it is. Or price change could rise because there's changes in marginal cost, wages, imported inputs, other inputs. Whenever we estimate exchange rate pass-through, that is necessarily a combination of all three of these components. And so when we do our event study, we're going to be looking at the evolution of prices in response to a large unilateral depreciation, and we'll simply follow how price responses change over time and whether these price response, the timing of these price responses differs for different types of invoicing currency schemes. The second thing we're going to do is to get at this question of is there something special strategically, some type of pricing to market behavior associated with particular currencies, we're going to hone in on this second component, the destination specific adjustment of the markup. And to do this, we're going to employ this trade pattern sequential fixed effects estimator. The way this operates, very simply, is we're going to have a firm and we're going to look at variation in its export prices it charges in different destinations and look at deviations in these export prices in order to, at the same time, control for unobserved changes in time bearing marginal cost or unobserved changes in the global markup. One of the advantages of this mechanism or of this trade pattern sequential fixed effects estimator is it can also potentially re or reduce potential bias associated with a firm's endogenous participation in specific destination markup markets. Um, to understand what I'm talking about when I'm talking about different invoicing currency schemes, um, I'll lay out, first of all, the data we're going to be using is confidential administrative customs data from Her Majesty's Revenue and Customs. It's the Overseas Trade and Goods Statistics, and it covers the universe of the UK's import and export transactions. Um, since 2010, this data also include, has included for every transaction the invoicing currency. Now, um, sadly, this data set does not include UK trade with the EU. That's recorded in a separate um, data set, and it doesn't record the invoicing currency. We do study the EU as well in this paper, and we can infer what we think is the most likely invoicing currency, um, but I won't get into that today. So I'll just say that for every firm, eight-digit product, foreign market, and unit of time, we can categorize each observation according to an invoicing scheme as either producer currency invoicing, if the transaction is invoiced in sterling, as local currency invoicing, if the transaction is invoiced in the destination market's currency, so Canadian dollars in Canada, sales going to Canada, or vehicle currency invoicing, if we see a third country's currency being used to invoice a transaction. So for example, US dollars for a sale to Mexico. Um, in the interest of time, I'm going to skip over the literature and get right into the results. I'll just say that this is a very active literature with a lot of new and important contributions, um, including some others using the UK data. In terms of, so I'll just, to get through these four facts, which I think are interesting, I'm just going to summarize these facts so that I can go on to the econometric analysis um, of the Brexit um, shock, as well as our longer term study of pricing to market. So I'll just say, when we look at UK trade, specifically focusing on the export side, UK exports to countries outside the EU are dominated by firms that use at least two currencies. So 99% of UK's export value to countries outside the EU originates from firms that use at least two currencies. Secondly, and this is a little bit more surprising, we observe that UK exporters 
use multiple currencies to invoice their sales of the same eight digit product within the same foreign market within the same year. So if we look at all UK export value, we find that 50% of UK exports going to extra EU destinations are by firms that are using multiple currencies within the same foreign destination when it's the same product. So shoes being sold in Canada, being invoiced both in Canadian dollars and maybe US dollars or Canadian dollars and pound sterling. Third, we observe our firms, if we restrict our attention only to those UK exporters who use a single currency within one calendar year for sales of a particular product in a particular destination. So we look at the, the firms that aren't using multiple currencies within a destination. For those firms, we observe them switching their unit of currency, uh, their currency scheme from one year to the next. So to be clear, if you use local currency at time T, the most likely choice of the firm is going to be local currency in time T plus one. But we also observe a non-trivial amount of firms switching. So for example, among all the firms that are using only a vehicle currency to invoice at time T, we observe 20% of those firms switching from vehicle currency to producer currency between times T and T plus one. And lastly, while we are observing a lot of mixing and churning by these firms, choosing multiple currencies, switching their currencies, in aggregate, everything is very stable. If we look at the aggregate shares of invoicing currencies for exports and imports, these are different, but over time from 2010 to 2017, they're remarkably stable. On the export side, about 60% of UK extra EU exports are invoiced in sterling about a third in a vehicle currency, and about 5% in local currencies. And so I'm just going to skip ahead. I have the tables and the slides um, that show how we develop those facts, but I'd like to move on to talking about um, the Brexit depreciation. So to summarize, our main findings when we look at weekly price movements in the year and a half before and the year and a half after the Brexit referendum vote, what we find is in the immediate aftermath of the Brexit referendum, those British exports that were invoiced in sterling had remarkably stable prices in sterling. Sterling prices rose very slowly, very gradually. In contrast, when we look at those UK export transactions that were invoiced in vehicle or local currency, we observed that the sterling prices for those transactions rose very quickly. Now, although on impact, there's quite a large deviation between these different invoicing currency schemes, when we follow the prices in sterling over a longer time horizon of a year and a half, we find that the differences in pricing across currency schemes narrows quite a bit, and all prices tend to align with the weaker value of the pound sterling. What's going on? Well, as we see these sterling prices rise gradually, we know we also estimate the responsiveness of import, UK import prices to the movements of the sterling. Basically, after about 36 weeks, UK imports had almost fully adjusted to the depreciation of the pound. And so we see when we look at the export prices, this gradual increase most likely associated or one factor certainly increases in the cost of imported inputs. Finally, while we do see all of these prices rising over time and we do see a shrinking of the differences across the invoicing currency schemes, one thing that stands out is when we look at the sterling export price of those goods that are invoiced in local currency, the increase in the, the sterling price somewhat exceeded the appreciation of the foreign currencies to which these goods were being sold. So this arguably suggests that in the early days after the depreciation, the firms were somewhat stabilizing their markup or pricing to market, and then kept keeping their markup somewhat constant as the price of their imported inputs that went into these exports um, rose, the price was gradually rising as well. So 
To be more specific, um, recall I already showed you this equation. Price changes consist of global markup adjustments, destination specific markup adjustments, changes in marginal cost. We're going to look at all three of those things together. Our econometric specification follows Benedio, Fisher, and Sare. And so we're simply going to be regressing prices at the firm product destination and unit of time. These are weekly prices on firm product destination dummies and a series of time dummies that are going to capture the average price and the average price change week by week. We will estimate this equation for each of our three invoicing currency schemes. So first for producer currency, then we'll look at local currency, then we'll look at vehicle currency. And so here are our graphs. Um, on the x-axis, we have weeks before and after the 2016 Brexit referendum vote. On the y-axis, we have deviations from the average price in week zero. So the red line represents the movement of the exchange rate. The blue line represents the average price of a sterling invoice transaction. So what you can see is before the Brexit referendum vote, transactions invoiced in sterling are basically flat. They're around zero. After the Brexit referendum vote, the pound immediately depreciates by about 10% gradually increasing to almost 20%. Over this period, we see very little change in the sterling price on impact, but a very gradual increase until it basically comes into alignment with the pound after a year and a half. In contrast, if we look at, sorry, I skipped a slide. If we look at those transactions that were invoiced in local currency, we see um, prior to the Brexit referendum, these local currency prices, uh, transactions invoiced in local currency, they're jumping around zero. After the Brexit referendum vote and the sharp depreciation of the pound, prices invoice, the sterling price of transactions invoiced in local currency immediately jump up, match up with the pound once we're about four weeks out, track it. And then once we hit 36 weeks, when import prices in Britain have risen, you see that the sterling price of these local currency transaction actually is exceeding the exchange rate movement. And finally, when we look at vehicle currency invoice transactions, here we have dollars. The path looks much more similar to local currency invoice transactions than it does to the um, producer currency invoice transactions, tracking quite closely um, over the whole period. Okay, so having um, shown you the dynamics of exchange rate pass-through and how these vary across the three invoicing currency schemes, what we're taking away from this is there's a little bit of a hint that there's something special about local currency invoice transactions and something where the markups seem to adjust um, quite a bit at the beginning, at the, at, right after the depreciation. So now what we're going to do is we're going to widen our window and we're going to look at how prices are evolving between 2010 and 2017. Again, we're going to be looking at UK um, exports to all extra EU destinations. And we're going to do two things. First, we're just going to estimate the export price elasticity to the exchange rate. This is one minus exchange rate pass through into import prices. When we look at transactions that are invoiced in producer or vehicle currency, we estimate rather um, modest responsiveness of the export price to the exchange rate. So for PCI, it's only 0.24. For VCI transactions, it's only 0.35. Both of these correspond to relatively high rates of exchange rate pass through into import prices. In contrast, when we look at local currency invoice transactions, we estimate quite responsive export prices to exchange rate movements implying relatively low exchange rate pass through into import prices. This raises the question of why is it that exchange rate pass through into import prices is so low for the local currency invoice transactions? This leads us to looking at the destination specific markup elasticity to the exchange rate. When we estimate this for all three currency schemes, we find essentially no destination specific markup adjustments for producer or vehicle currency invoice transactions, but quite substantial destination specific markup adjustments for those transactions invoiced in local currency. And to quantify how important this is, we can look at the ratio of the markup adjustment 
to the extent of uh, export price responsiveness. And this tells us that 68% of the incomplete exchange rate pass-through is arising because the exporter is adjusting its markup in the different destination markets. Okay, so in more detail, um, the first thing I want to tell you is that to understand trade pattern fixed effects, we need to understand a little bit about what a typical firm and product level trade pattern looks like. So in the data, um, when we look at a firm selling a product in different destinations, we observe trade patterns like the stylized one I'm presenting here. So for example, in period one, a firm will sell the product in two destinations, countries A and B. However, in period two, it could drop its sales to country B entirely and add a new market, country C. For something, factors change. In the third period, the firm has now re-entered B and added a fourth market. In the fourth period, it's dropped out of B and D again, and in the fifth, it's moved back into those markets. So what we observe here is we say that we observe two repeating trade patterns. One is that in periods two and four, the firm is selling in markets A and C, and in periods three and five, the firm is selling in markets A, B, C, and D. Now, in our previous work, we show that if the factors that determine a firm's selection into a set of destinations are relatively stable, then controlling for the firm's trade pattern helps address some of the selectionist bias associated with endogenous participation in markets. Okay. So what we're going to do when we want to estimate our export price elasticity is the first thing is we're going to regress just the price at the firm product destination time level on the corresponding exchange rate measure of CPI. And we're also going to control not just for the destination, but for the destination and the trade pattern the firm is reaching in that period. Okay, and so this is in a sense, it's a stronger control than just controlling for the destination because we're also controlling for all the unobserved factors associated with the firm choosing that trade pattern in that time period. Now, when we want to estimate the destination specific markup elasticity, the key thing is we have to, we have to isolate the destination specific component of the price. And the way we do this is in the first step, for every firm and product we observe in our data set, we calculate its average price in every period. The average price average over all the destinations it reaches. Then we can construct the residual from this average price. So I know how the price deviation, for example, of a sale to Japan relative to the average of all the destinations reached in that period. I'm then gonna take these destination demeaned price residuals and I will regress them on destination demeaned exchange rates and other controls, as well as trade pattern fixed effects. So what this does, essentially, I've highlighted in blue all of the destination, um, destinations reached, or DIFT is a index that tells us which destinations the firm is reaching with product I in period T. So what this enables us to do is isolate the destination specific component of the price while controlling and making sure that when I'm comparing changes in these destination specific components of the price, I'm always comparing them intertemporally with a set of prices reached when that firm is hitting the same trade pattern. So to the extent that there are variables that are driving me into one trade pattern or another, I'm controlling for those unobservable components. Okay. Two minutes. To okay. <laughs> so speeding up. So what do we get when we do this? Okay. So the first thing, using monthly data across all invoicing currency schemes, when I estimate the price elasticity, we get an estimate of 0.35. What this tells us is if the foreign currency appreciates by 1%, the export price in sterling is going to rise by 35 hundredths of 1%. Or equivalently, exchange rate pass-through is incomplete. It's about 65%. I can then use the destination, I can then estimate the destination specific markup elasticity. Here it is 0.09. Together, these two facts tell me that when I look at the share of exchange rate pass-through that's incomplete, 
I find in total about 26% of it is due to destination specific markup adjustments made by the firm. So that's when I'm not paying any attention to which currency the transaction is invoiced in. I can then expand to look at each individual invoicing currency scheme. So I'll look at PCI, VCI, and LCI, headline findings. When I look at producer or vehicle currency invoice transactions, the export price elasticity is relatively low implying a high level of exchange rate pass through into import prices, 76% for producer currency, 65% for vehicle currency. However, for local currency invoice transactions, it's relatively modest, only 37%. I then go on and I estimate the markup elasticities for each of these invoicing currency schemes. And what I find is for producer and vehicle currency, it's zero. There's nothing going on there. The firm is not setting a specific price for different destination markets in response to exchange rates. However, for local vehicle, local currency invoicing, the firm is adjusting its markup in response to changes in the bilateral currency between the sterling and whatever country they're going to. When I try, when I use these two numbers for local currency invoicing together, I can see that of the component of incomplete pass-through, the 37% that's not moving into import prices, I can see that 68, oh, sorry, I said that all muddled. The share of incomplete exchange rate pass-through into import prices that's accounted for by destination-specific markup adjustments is 68%. So I'll wrap it up there. What we find in this paper, firstly, in response to the big depreciation after the Brexit referendum, local and vehicle currency invoice transactions move very quickly in response to the movement of the sterling, much more quickly than producer currency invoice transactions. We also see that exchange rate pass through into import prices is much lower for local currency invoice transactions. And only for local currency invoice transactions do we see destination specific markup adjustments? So altogether, this suggests that if you want to engage in pricing to market, the firm is actively choosing to invoice in local currency rather than one of the other options. We also identify a number of facts about firm invoicing. Firms are using multiple currencies, even within a market, and they're switching currencies over time. Why is this important? We feel that we're contributing theoretically relevant facts to the debate over vehicle currency and export pricing. So first of all, if we think about what we've learned from Gita Gopinath's studies of the international price system, we're contributing that when you invoice in vehicle currency, we're observing no destination specific price adjustments, suggesting that firms in fact are choosing vehicle currency when they want to price to, low, to global rather than local conditions. We also observe there's substantial markup adjustments for local currency invoice transactions and that firms are switching currencies over time. How unique is the UK? A lot of its trade is invoiced in dollars and euros, very similar to what we see previous studies for Canadian exporters. Why do we see firms using such a plethora of currencies? This points to an earlier literature that looked at thinking about our firms endogenously choosing the extent of exchange rate pass-through optimally. Do they, do they specify an overall desired level of pass-through? Here we're showing that that could be implemented by the firms choosing different groups of currencies. We'll stop there, thanks. Thank you very much, Meredith. Uh, Tommaso Aquilante from the Bank of England is gonna discuss the paper. Uh, Tommaso, you've got 10 minutes. Great. Uh, well, thank you, Ambrogio, and thank you uh, for uh, giving me the opportunity to, to discuss this paper. Let me just move this here. Um, this is a, this is a, a really um, nice paper, and I learned a lot um, from, from reading it. Um, so before I start, um, the disclaimers that uh, Meredith uh, pointed out also apply uh, to me, because I, I'm going to draw on uh, some um, uh, work that I have done on the on the same data and on top of that there is the disclaimer that uh, um, whatever I go, I'm gonna say these are personal views that will not reflect the views of the Bank of England or uh, of its um, uh, committees so uh, the paper is very rich 
And so I made a choice. Uh, I said, uh, okay, what I, do I focus on? And I decided to focus on exchange rate pass through. Uh, and I decided to focus especially on facts, on the facts that uh, Meredith uh, uh, has explained. And I, I'll try to do that uh, through the lens of uh, essentially firm heterogeneity. So um, I guess, uh, we, uh, we, we all understand why exchange rate pass-through is important. It is important for monetary policy. It is important for shock transmission. It is important uh, for consumer and producer prices. Um, you know, most of, of these papers actually are, uh, um, you know, uh, that, that you see here have been written by one of the co-authors of, Med of Meredith on this paper. So it shouldn't surprise uh, anyone, I guess, uh, that there is a, there is a, a lot of relevance, especially for a small open economy like the UK for uh, the topic. I guess uh, the novelty that the last 10 years of literature um, uh, have brought is this idea of uh, looking a little bit uh, uh, into, you know, more, more deep into, into what are the, the choices uh, of, um, of firms, or at least what, what are the invoicing currents, uh, what are the, the currencies that firms uh, used to price uh, their imports and their and their exports, and uh, um, I, I guess one takeaway from this literature is that if you don't take into account uh, vehicle currencies, which essentially means uh, that you know there can be a UK firm which is exporting to um, uh, to the US, but it's not using uh, it's it, it, it isn't using neither uh, the the sterling pound nor the US dollar to price its goods, then you will miss a big part of how exchange rate pass through uh, works. Now, one thing that I like about this paper, I mean, like, you know, the, the, the empirical design is, is actually uh, very nice. I guess, you know, we, we, we all understand what, uh, what um, uh, the Brexit, well, sorry, the EU referendum did uh, to, um, uh, to exchange rates. So this was a sudden depreciation. It was unexpected, it was large. So. I don't have many comments on the on the on, on the empirical design, and Meredith has explained that better than I could do. But I want to focus on. I, I will have three set of comments, and I will uh, uh, essentially conclude with a, a general set uh, of comments. So the first one that I have is on the dominance of of uh, multi-currency firms, which is something that also Meredith has touched upon. And it's like, uh, you know, essentially there, there's a very small uh, uh, set of um, uh, firms, which, uh, sorry, uh, there is a large um, uh, share of trade, which is dominated by uh, firms that invoice in more uh, than, than one country. And so I was thinking to what extent, and here I'm aware that, you know, the trade data at HMRC uh, does not provide, uh, you know, um, other characteristics of firms like I don't know uh, productivity or size, although it can be matched with uh, with other data sets out there. But I was wondering to what extent this is, uh, you know, the set of firms that we could we could call the happiest of the happy few. You would remember that there is a paper by Ottaviano and Meyer. Um, in, in 2008 called uh, the happy few, uh, which essentially says that there is a very small fringe of export of firms that, uh, that export. And uh, I guess if you look at, um, um, you know, this, uh, the left-hand side chart, which is something uh, that comes from some internal work we did at the bank, you will see that there is a very small fringe of these exporters and importers as well. Uh, which actually uh, uh, are, is responsible for a, a huge share of total trade. This is about 70% on the, uh, more than 70% on the import uh, and export side. And this is out of the, um, like the total popula population of exporters, it's about 1,200 firms. So really a small fringe of firms. And something similar can actually be be seen for productivity, right? And uh, you know uh, there are few firms which are disproportionately more productive than uh, than all the others. And of course, we know in the literature that there is an overlap uh, between um, you know being more productive, being more uh, being an exporter, but also being more innovative, and so on and so forth. So I was uh, the first question that I had is like you know whether there's a way to go uh, you know a little bit deeper into this, even having some sort of uh, predetermined firm level uh, measure of size, uh, even based on, 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 on international sales, 
um, uh, to, to try and understand whether size matters basically here. So that would be the first comment. The second comment um, is instead on something that really uh, got my attention. And I think this is, uh, while the first fact is interesting, uh, but perhaps not entirely surprising given the literature, I think the second fact is really novel and fascinating. So this thing that the same firm for uh, the same product uses uh, in the same destination, uses different currencies at the same time, uh, it, I think it really deserves um, more um, analysis and, and, and probably calls for some theory uh, as well. Now, of course, as, as the authors say in the, in the, in the paper, uh, they don't have firm to firm data and uh, you know and, and and I know that, that this is the case because I'm using the same uh, the same data so we can argue we can ask, we can speculate that relationship tend to be super sticky uh, at the firm to firm level and so you know we can probably attribute uh, that uh, uh, to the fact that indeed instead of uh, you know uh, that the mechanism at work here is that uh, uh, firms tend to use different currencies for different buyers in the same destination for the same product, but we will, will, we will only be uh, speculating. What the, instead the others, uh, the others uh, do in the paper is to uh, have some facts on uh, the persistency of um, uh, invoicing schemes uh, over time, um, which I, as Meredith said, uh, you, know, are, uh, you know, are very persistent. And here I wonder, whether we can go a little bit and, and exploit the variation, if any, that there is in the data uh, across sectors. There is some literature out there, uh, John Lewis and Ida Isorsi uh, have a paper on uh, nonlinearities across sectors. Uh, we know that, you know, uh, that, uh, that, 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 that homogeneous goods tend to be priced differently than differentiated goods. Uh, or, and, you know, similar uh, argument could be made for final uh, versus intermediate goods. I wonder whether there is some uh, some some interesting story there. Whether these uh, uh, you know different sectors um, firms in these different sectors had a different uh, reaction to the Brexit uh, shock. And the other thing is, uh, it has to do with. Uh, with, with something that uh, I, I'm also thinking a little bit about uh, in the context of um, of, uh, of my work, um, it's uh, I guess the way uh, like you know the, the way you react you, you can switch whether you can switch uh, currency really is going to depend on you of course but I guess it's going to depend a lot within uh, uh, you know what what is your bargaining power within the relationship with, that you have with your buyer. Uh, and again, this calls for firm-to-firm -firm, uh, data, which is not available. But I think that you know some uh, proxy for firm bargaining power, so basically market shares for, say, UK firms, uh, a, a specific UK firm relative to the, the complete set of firms that exports the same product uh, to the same destination, could, could probably give you an idea of what is the ability of this firm to change, for example, currency if there is if they face um, a shock. Uh, the third comment uh, that I have, and this is more for uh, the regression uh, uh, part, both on uh, like the exchange rate pass through regressions. And, uh, less than a minute, so you should try and wrap up. Okay, I'll wrap up with the following then. Uh, um, you know, uh, and then I send probably um, that this lies to Meredith and Giancarlo and so on. I think um, there are there are two things I would I would conclude with. So the the first one is um, whether we can say wh whether there is a possibility to analyze uh, like to to exploit more the fact that some well a, a good fringe of exporters in this data are also important importers and this should have an effect on the way they price. And the other thing is like, you know, this dominance uh, for uh, the fact that essentially, uh, you know, that the, 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 the exchange rate pass through is in the hands of a, of a small fringe of firms. Like, is it uh, good, good or bad news for policy? I think the, I, I will leave it there. Thank you very much, Tommaso. Um, we are quite a lot over time. Um, so I might suggest that, um, uh, you and actually there's been quite active uh, answers by uh, Giancarlo on the Q&A box. 
So I might suggest that maybe you can pick up some of the points that uh, Tommaso uh, raised in his discussion bilaterally and we move directly to the last paper, just for fairness to the last paper, otherwise we're going to be squeezed. Um, so uh, if that's okay, I'm going to ask uh, Bruce Iwadate to uh, upload his slides. Um, he's going to present uh, the last paper of the session, which is titled Global Value Chains and Stock Market Co-Movement. Um, I can see your slide, Bruce, and you just need to unmute yourself. Thanks for having me. Uh, so this is uh, a joint work with uh, Rafael and Andreas Alex. Alex. Um, and this is more about um, asset market as opposed to uh, an important question in the international trade. So I just want to make it clear. Um, so, sorry. So we tackled the, um, the why assets really co-move, interna especially international equity market. And we are trying to use the uh, global uh, value chain data to, uh, to find a general link between these two. And, and this is, I mean, clearly uh, important because of all the things happening about international trade, uh, protectionism, and then supply chain disruption regarding COVID-19 and stuff. Um, and then thirdly, um, so surprisingly, the literature uh, has been a failing to linking this stock return co-movement um, and international trade. And so what we do in this paper is basically three things. So, um, so first we're gonna propose uh, model implied measures to examine how real integration matters for a profit and thus equity market co-movement. And just a, a preview of the result. So one standard deviation increase in the measure that we propose, uh, that leads to a 22 to 24% of one standard deviation in correlations of equity co-movement, so which is around 0.05 to uh, 0.1. So uh, it's, it's quite sizable. Um, and then number two, so we um, uh, trying to assemble the database uh, of biological final trade goods and intermediate goods trade um, and uh, as much as possible. So we combine a couple of data and, and span from 1980 to 2017 and then covering up to 1,560 country pairs. And then thirdly, um, uh, as far as we know, uh, this is uh, uh, the present the first uh, strong evidence that uh, real integration actually can explain a stock market co-movement. Um, so uh, we kind of want to, where we want to allude to is basically we want to say uh, we need to reconsider whether only financial integration matters. Okay, so um, relating to literature, so I, I wouldn't go pick every single paper. So just summer, to summarize, so we contributed th basically three uh, literature, and the first one is clearly a uh, asset movement and international asset pricing. And to summarize, um, this is really a classical question that a uh, very old paper has tried to tackle or studied, uh, such as Amar May uh, or uh, other old papers. But surprisingly, the evidence is quite weak, and which is very uh, summarized well in uh, a Beckard paper in 2016. Um, there are some attempts in the earlier days, but either econometric, uh, econometrically limited or a sample is limited, and, and it's just weak. Um, and then there's other two literature, uh, so network asset returns just start to kind of grow. And then clearly the, there's other branch of trade and GVC and output inflation, more macroeconomics literature that try to use trade. Um, and I just need to mention uh, probably two paper that recently trying to um, use this global value chain and trade um, a data to address a question in asset pricing, which is, um, uh, Robert Richmond paper 2019, which is your trade data to trying to explain a currency risk premium. Uh, and also um, a very recently, uh, Di Giovanni and Hale. Uh, so they also use a, um, a global value chain data, but uh, their focuses um, are more about how US monetary policy shock would propagate to other rest of the world stock market. So just to uh, make 
the distinction between our paper and their paper. So our paper is more about trying to find uh, a general, general link between um, international trade and value chain and um, more low frequency um, um, equity code movement. Okay. Now, so this is just to uh, give kind of observation about what is the general feature about stock return code movement. So this is um, uh, average correlation of um, pairwise correlation, um, equity correlation between across the countries uh, colored by um, the country eyes uh, country group. So advanced emerging and frontier. So um, I mean, for, first it's quite time varying and, and some of the features are quite, uh, it could be trivial, for instance, around uh, a great financial crisis, uh, a lot of asset moves in the same direction in the bear market, therefore correlation would really um, goes up. But then after that, there is plunge and then there's some incre uptick after that. So it's not entirely clear that um, it, it's purely driven by uh, financial market itself or there's other factors. And, and then there's also um, the outliers um, that you see kind of uh, around 1990 to 2000, it kind of the outliers kind of uh, disappear over time. Um, okay, so uh, this plot is, um, this is plotting a, a correlation of each individual country's equity index against the um, MSCI world. So. Um, uh, with the uh, traditional trade major, which is simple uh, export plus import over GDP. Um, and the correlation is rescale so that it's, it's gonna have the infinite support. Um, so it, it's, it really summarizes the literature that the relationship between the uh, trade activity and the equity commitments are empirically very scarce. Even though theoretically it's very plausible and, and easy to show, it's um, not there empirically. Okay. Uh, so these are just visualization probably. Um, this audience knows much better than me, so I would just skip. Um, so, so this really summarizes our central result, so uh, which is with our major, which we call intermediate trade intensity, which is on the right hand panel, um, with our major, we could show this a positive relationship between a critical movement and the trade activity between a uh, pair of countries. Okay. Now, uh, so I'm going to explain how we kind of construct the a measure, the trade intensity. So we start to out with very basic variables that everyone probably is familiar. Um, home shares uh, based on exports and also the intermediate goods and final exports, okay? So, uh, so models in the paper, but the essence is um, in two country case, we express uh, a profit, deviation of profit of country one and we could express that as a linear combination of a exports of intermediate goods and final goods weighted by these uh, elasticity of substitution and also combined with the demand shock and uh, supply shock. Okay, so the first uh, term, this part, so this part is, so S, one one is this is um, the home share in country one, okay, uh, for the final goods, okay, and a D one is demand shock to that country, and uh, this uh, the second term is the export from country one to two uh, for final goods and product with the uh, demand shock to country two, and the 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 sec second bunch. Uh, within second bunch of this third term is this intermediate goods uh, home home share for country one and which is product with the 
uh, supply shock to that country. And the last bit is uh, intermediate goods between uh, from country one to two um, product uh, with the uh, supply shock with country two. Okay, so uh, what really these are different from uh, conventional trade major is basically that there is a shock part, right? Um, there are those, we are trying to combine these uh, shocks, how shock might enter um, these profit um, using um, these international tr uh, trade variables, okay? So, so once we know what's a profit function, deviation of profit function for one country, so this is, this is symmetric, so uh, for two country, uh, so we could express what is a correlation between two. So under simplifying assumption, so we, it needs to be a symmetric and independent demand and supply shock, um, then we could express a correlation between two countries, uh, each country's profit as a linear combination of these two um, quantities. And, and we call this first um, combination of final goods and home share uh, between two countries as FTI, uh, final trade intensity, and the other one, so this is a combination of intermediate goods, home share, and the exports as intermediate trade intensity. So you can see this, the other part, the this the coefficient part as uh, a beta um, uh, for in this case um, this is demand shock beta and the other one is the supply shock beta. Okay, um, so this is just uh, give you some numerical example to give you how this construction could be different from traditional major. So um, take an example uh, between France and USA. So in this case, so and the other example is Belgium and Russia. So between these two intermediate trade intensity, um, the second term is actually uh, not that different. So the export from France to USA and also export to Belgium to Russia is pretty much the same and which is multiplied by the home share of co country J, which is USA and also Russia. So these are also pretty much the same. So the second term really doesn't much make a difference. And so first term really make a difference that is either uh, import from USA to France, which is 0 0.011, or import from J to one in the, uh, the Belgian Russia case. So the Russia to Belgium, so which is 0 0.07, or the home share of country I, which is uh, home share of France, 0.88, um, and home share of Belgium, which is 0.53, which is um, small, right? So it really that the uh, combining uh, by kind of the, this model uh, derived uh, a measure, combining kind of the, con considering the home share, um, may make a difference uh, in terms of uh, in the result of trade intensity between country pairs, okay? Um, so visually, so um, how would that stand against um, traditional trade measures? So this is just plotting a um, average of this bilateral measure um, of international trade intensity um, over country J uh, against this uh, non-bilateral major, uh, traditional trade major. So certain countries, I mean, it probably doesn't make much difference. So which is more uh, about Slovakia, uh, Czech, uh, Ireland, um, these countries. But certain countries, for instance, Germany, uh, USA, so the countries that are um, more like a central node uh, in the uh, trade network uh, seems to uh, make a difference uh, which uh, trade major um, we apply. So um, 
this is to uh, more about the sunny tea trek. So the, the trail literature really uh, studied um, how more about kind of network structure in the trade. So we want to make sure that um, this third, uh, the intimated goods that is through the third country wouldn't distort our results. So we, we this is the same definition as Johnson no Grela paper. Uh, we, as kind of supplement, um, we trying to make sure our results are not really driven by the uh, indirect effects. So we're gonna use uh, the value added major that is being uh, studied in the trade literature um, to um, our setting. And the left hand side variable, so um, we are really trying to be as general and as and uh, universal as possible. So we uh, simply use realized annual correlation of daily returns as opposed, as opposed to more uh, some fancier majors that you, you might think. And, and this is actually um, um, econometrically uh, uh, supported by uh, Brandfall, Nielsen, and Shepard, uh, but also quite widely used in other beyond the international community literature, such as Pollitt and Mungo's paper or other papers as well. And one thing I note is uh, just to have the infinite support, we, we just uh, rescale this correlation. Um, and in, in terms of robustness, whether or not rescaling um, um, we do rescaling really doesn't change our result that much. Okay. Um, so data, so um, probably um, nothing so unusual, but just to mention this trade data, the second uh, blood point. So we uh, combine um, this Johnson Norella data uh, and the uh, WIOD and MRIO data, and, and, and we chain at the 2007 and 2008 so that um, it's going to have the very longer, as long as possible, and also as wide coverage as as much. Okay. Um, so this, all right, let me skip this. So uh, this is a, a baseline uh, estimation. Uh, so we start with the role correlation, and our our results are um, robust to uh, role correlation as well. So so it's co second column is our kind of starting point that international, uh, sorry, uh, intermediate trade intensity uh, positively um, relates to the equity co-movements, okay? And as ITI and FTI, so two, column two and three, th these are highly correlated uh, between 0 0.8 to 0 0.8. So we, we chose to uh, orthogonalize, the, orthogonalize them and also standardize them for, uh, comparison purposes. Uh, so that's four, column four and five. And, and then important column here is uh, column five. So after we time, putting a time fixed effect, our result is quite strong. Um, so earlier literature uh, in the, uh, this international code movement and uh, the trade, uh, which is summarized in the Beckard paper 2016, um, after those earlier studies, once you start putting the time trends or time fixed effect, uh, those result vanishes, okay? So to stress that uh, our result is uh, robust to these uh, time trends and time fixed effect, okay? And also we kind of, as a sanity check, we do with the value added, okay? So either exporter or importer, um, and the, these are robust to these, uh, alternatives um, measure as well. And, 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 and then next we introduce a bunch of these variables that is heavily studied in uh, trade literature, um, those socioeconomic economic variables, uh, starting with um, so distance, contiguity, which is whether or not the countries next to each other, and other common official language, and so on. And, and overall, th these are, our results uh, are robust to that. Um, and, and then to set up the more uh, robust uh, baseline uh, specification, we either we choose um, putting a country fixed effect, which is uh, column four, or we could uh, add a country pair fixed effect. And in both cases, um, our results are 
are quite robust, uh, especially inter intermediate trade intensity. And between five, column five and six, so either country pair or country fixed effect. So if we do statistical test, um, the tests show that um, country fixed effect is uh, better. So we set our um, baseline model as a six, okay? So we, we stick with the last uh, a column, okay? Now, so now, so as we want to argue, um, the, e the stock co-movement are not just driven by financial integration, and we want to argue uh, these are as much driven by real integration as well. So we want to include a financial uh, a variables and also econo some other uh, economic variable. So uh, we add these total asset holding, equity holding, debt holding, these are from IMF. Uh, and these three are highly correlated. So we, we just separately put it for them. Um, and ITI, again, ITI, the intermediate trade intensity uh, are robust to uh, these uh, controls. And then we're going to add the cycle. This is a GDP cycle and also realized variance. Um, and again, so these uh, other variables, um, intermediate trade intensity is uh, quite robust to those additional controls. Um, and, and this is more about Stanichi check. So we, instead of using intermediate trade intensity, we um, substituted by value added from uh, Johnson Noguela. And in, again, these are somewhat economic magnitudes are a weaker, um, slightly weaker, but uh, overall um, the result are, uh, remains uh, strong. Um, and this is a farm market. So, uh, so for uh, a trade audience might, may or may not be familiar. So farm market is uh, oft, sometimes used in um, more empirical asset pricing literature. This, so this is just a cross-sectional regression. Um, and what I'm showing is time series average of which, okay? Uh, so the, the purpose of this is um, so whether or not uh, to make sure the result in the panel, these are not really driven by uh, within country kind of variation only, okay? So um, even with the cross-sectional regression, uh, our uh, result are, uh, remains uh, a strong. Um, Bruce, you have, and, two, you have two minutes yeah. to wrap up. Okay, sure, thank you. Um, so this is showing this uh, coefficient from this uh, cross-sectional regression over time. And this um, is, could be intuitive. So over time, the, the influence from real integration to a critical movement is overall waning, okay? Um, especially um, the, around the GFC, um, because this time, clearly, the uh, financial um, market-driven um, coefficients are much larger. But then after that, it kind of back up. Okay, so, but over time, it's kind of waning. Okay. Um, then the rest is um, the subsample result we studied by time or uh, split by countries. Um, overall intermediate trade intensity um, are, remains uh, are strong. Uh, and also, lastly, so the deterministic trend. So this is also in the literature. Uh, so the, as pointed out in the Beckert paper, um, the earlier result uh, of linkage between trade and uh, equity co-movements are mostly killed, uh, vanishes uh, once you considering deterministic trend. So this is to show that our result is robust to those um, controls. So let me just summarize. Um, so what we did, uh, so first we established a strong, strong link between trade and equity prices. So higher trade intensity explains higher equity movements 
and importantly, the robust financial base major and stronger than conventional trade base major of openness. And secondly, the, uh, we kind of bridging the um, global value chain data to international asset pricing and uh, uh, confirming uh, the growing importance of trade networks in non-trade literature and, and more granular uh, construction really helps um, explaining poorly documented channel as opposed to uh, traditional measures. Um, and also importance of intermediate trade intensity. And then lastly, uh, so implication for either um, policymakers or uh, more industry people. Uh, so implication of portfolio management. So we, so many things is happening uh, about international trade lately, but still people are often, you know, tends to talk about, you know, particular stock, for instance, like Huawei or TikTok, ByteDance, right? Um, but then uh, our kind of implication is that it, it, it could be beyond that, so more than that, as uh, more about diversification uh, point of view, um, uh, studying or, or kind of getting implication from the trade uh, system kind of alignment uh, across the country would uh, give um, some insight about the uh, co-movements across the um, uh, stock indices uh, around the world. Um, yeah, much. that's it. Thank you. We're over time. Uh, I'm going to give the floor to Thomas Drexel from the University of Maryland. Hello from uh, Washington, D.C. Very excited about discussing this uh, really cool paper. So thank you to the organizers for giving me the opportunity to do so. Let me start with the basics and let me also introduce a bit of my own uh, notation throughout this discussion. What does this paper study? The authors are interested in how the stock market co-moves uh, between different economies. So here V is the value of the stock market uh, in two different economies. Uh, Delta transforms this into returns because uh, strictly speaking, the authors consider return co-movement. Um, and then we're interested in whether these things co-move between economy I and economy J. The basic premise of this paper is that trade inter integration or the presence of global value chain should affect this object of interest, should affect this co-movement of the stock market between different economies. Because if firms trade with each other, they may be hit by shocks. These shocks spill over to their trading partners and you know, fluctuations in these firms affect how uh, their profits and their value fluctuate and then the overall stock market becomes uh, correlated across economies. Now the literature uh, has acknowledged that this uh, that you know this effect should be there. However, has failed to find this link uh, empirically. And in particular, if you look at um, at you know broader net uh, trade flows and look at whether they can explain stock market co movement, you don't really find a very strong effect. Now, this paper uh, aims to do better than this literature. Um, what they do is that they compile detailed data on input-output linkages between sectors in different economy. And this makes this data much more granular than the data that has uh, previously been used in two ways. First of all, there's sector-level information. And second of all, it's not only netted out uh, trade flows, it is the actual information on the final and the intermediate input use. Uh, based on this data, the authors then aggregate back to the country level and construct um, a trade intensity measure. For the time being, I call that TI here. Um, and then they show that this TI measure actually does quite strongly explain stock market co-movement across different economies. A few more highlights. Um, I think it's a nice uh, data effort uh, undertaken by the authors, which involves chaining uh, different sources, um, which allows them to have a, a pretty nice coverage over time across countries and across sectors. What I really like about the paper is that the trade intensity measure that they construct is guided by theory 
So they set up a, a multi-country equilibrium model in which there is final good and intermediate good trade. And then what comes out of this model is that profits co-move based um, on these two uh, measures that they construct, the intermediate trade intensity and the final goods trade intensity. And then the headline finding is that especially this ITI measure for intermediate goods uh, uh, is very strongly associated with stock market co-movement. A one standard deviation increase uh, shows that the co-movement between uh, uh, equity valuation across two economies rises by a quarter of a standard deviation. I'm going to have um, one kind of big comment which relates to, which starts from a theoretical point on the fact that valuation is not only explained by cash flows, but also by, by discount rates. And I think this insight can sharpen uh, much better the, re the regression specification that the authors set up. For my taste, there is a little bit too much of, I have a main specification and then I throw in all sorts of stuff to show that things are robust. But there are things that you may actually not want to, to throw into the regressions. And I'm going to be more specific about that. And then in the end, I have a number of additional thoughts that I can, um, that I can mention quite briefly. So it's mainly about this, this one big point that I, that I want to make and that I hope is helpful. So let me on this point go back to the object of interest, which is this correlation between returns in two economies. Theory tells us that this valuation should be driven by the expected future flow of dividends uh, by companies that are listed on the stock market in a particular economy, discounted with the stochastic discount factor that is applied uh, to the country, um, to, to, the, to the stock market in this country. And if financial markets are not fully integrated, if it's not the same investor holding these stocks, then the stochastic discount factor is also different across uh, two economies. I said I liked a lot the, you know, the, the fact that these uh, measures are constructed based on theoretical guidance. However, this, this model that the authors present really only maps those measures into the correlation between dividends or, or profits. However, uh, as I mentioned, discount rates across different economies that are applied to uh, evaluate stocks may also be correlated across economies. And this may also be tr driven by trade integration. The paper does kind of uh, informally acknowledge that in the introduction, but then kind of loses this point uh, over time, which I think is, is unfortunate. Um, so this is, this is one thing. It's, it's about um, what, what drives uh, cross-country co-movement in discount rates. And then there's also, of course, other things that is not in the model that may drive uh, correlation in dividends that is that is absent from the model and that's something uh, that that the authors do think about in the regressions but you have to kind of piece these these things uh, out uh, more clearly in my view so let me provide some some kind of loosely theoretical framework as a suggestion on how you can think about that so the authors try to disentangle what they call real integration or trade integration from financial integration. Now, both of these broader trends drive correlation in dividends and drive correlation in discount rates. Real integration drives correlation in, in, um, in profits or dividends through these direct trade relations of firms. And the model in the paper shows this very nicely. But it also, as I mentioned, drives a correlation in discount rates. Um, and this happens in some sense through uh, the synchronization of the macroeconomic environments in, in the countries. So suppose there is no financial integration and only the domestic citizens of a country hold, their, hold the stocks of their own stock market. If because of trade integration, aggregate consumption growth in these two economies becomes more synchronized, then the stochastic discount factors become more synchronized, and then the stock market will co-move more strongly. And this is given the correlation of dividends. 
Now, financial integration, on the other hand, also drives these two things. Yeah. Um, it, Thomas, you have less than two minutes, please. Okay, thank you. Um, so it drives the, the correlation in profits through direct financial links of companies. And it again drives the correlation of discount rates through financial integration in the sense that there are some global investors that may hold the stocks in both economies and that may price both economies at the same time. So what I have in mind is that the way the regressions in the paper are set up should have in mind two different goals. One goal is to quantify the overall contribution of real integration, which means accounting for how it drives correlation in profits and correlation in discount rates. And then disentangled these two channels. So I named these effects here A, B, C, D. And I think for every regression, I would want to know what are you showing? What are you controlling for? And one of these goals is A and B controlling for C and D. And the other goal is uh, uh, A and controlling for B, C, and D. So this is expositional, but it may also warrant fur adding further controls. I need to spe speed up a little bit. So what I, what I basically want to say is that this ITI and FTI measure captures real integration, but the correlation, the increasing correlation in discount rates, you also want to have that in there. And some controls may be bad controls in the sense that they actually, actually capture this effect. So you do not want to add controls that account for macro uh, synchronization. And then if you want to control properly for financial integration, which is D, you may want to add something like global discount rates. For example, United States real consumption growth. Um, okay, and then, so, so what I think is done in the paper is actually the most heavy specifications in which you have country pair fixed effects and time fixed effects and controls. In that regression, I kind of believe that this is a nice way to isolate A from all the rest, but I suggest also isolating the combined effect of A and B, where you do want to have the effect on, of discount rate co-movement in there. Um, okay, just so that I say what I wanted to say. I have three more smaller thoughts on the paper. One is there's no, there's not a di direct overlap. You should try to wrap up because we're gonna uh, we're gonna close the session in two minutes, and uh, it would okay. be nice for Bruce to kind of react very quickly to your point. Let me. Okay, let me. I can just tell him these these uh, these uh, comments via email. Then let me let me just wrap up then. So I like the paper. I made this major comment. Um, as kind of a broader comment that I think can help, you know, discipline the analysis uh, a, a bit more. Um, thank you very much. Thank you, Thomas, and sorry for being so strict. Uh, no problem. I wanted to That's give your job. To, um, uh, to Bruce to react to uh, this very insightful discussion by by Thomas. Bruce. Sure. Uh, yes, Thomas. Thanks for. Uh, thanks very much. Uh, that was. Uh, that was a great. Uh, uh, I think comment. And uh, so mainly, yeah, you're talking about the discount rates and the cash flow uh, problem. So we are really aware of that. Um, and at this point, we kind of chose not to really go into kind of risk premia and those kind of story. Uh, and one kind of the uh, protecting argument is that, in, you know, if you think about those candle short decomposition, at the end of the day, those are identity, right? So if you just bring everything cash flow news and on the right hand side, you bring all the discount rate news, right? So in the end, it's going to come down to fundamental, right? So we could kind of try to, you know, I, we, I think we didn't state that in a paper. We kind of allude to that point so that we kind of not going to risk premium. But then I think it, it's really a fair point. And I think, um, you know, I think that given that it's coming from you, <laughs> this thing, uh, so I think we need to be more uh, carefully design how to uh, control this, uh, uh, the channel from this country. And also briefly mentioned the, also I saw the blood point about the uh, exchange rate. So, um, so in the literature also, the, it's in the Amar Maze paper really a long time ago. So if you do, uh, that was a study only between UK and US, but then um, the 
surprisingly, those uh, exchange rates role is very limited. It's mostly either discount rate and cash flow. And we are trying to show, um, uh, trying to kind of the, uh, show the real integration cash flow part matters. So we are uh, the originally kind of the, I think the literature uh, showed that the uh, exchange rate party wouldn't matter uh, uh, much in terms of these uh, uh, equity code movements. But yeah, thank you. And, and uh, it was a great, I think, point. Uh, thank you very much, much, Bruce. And uh, we are just one minute over time for the whole session. So let me thank you all the participants, all the panelists and attendees, and also big thanks to Silvana, who was apart from being very active in the chat box, uh, also helped with the uh, selection organization of the, of the session. And with this, uh, again, thank you. And I really hope to see you in person soon. Uh, and have a good evening. Thank you very much. Bye. Thank you all. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye.